So now we're going to move on to the view through the payer's lens. <clears throat> and the moderator of this discussion is Dr. Dean French. So if the panel would please come up. Good afternoon. Um, so this is a, a panel which I feel completely um, ill-equipped to facilitate, so, so, so bear with me. Uh, I think to start off with, I'd just like to do some introductions. So do we mind just starting at the end and just introducing? Sure. Oh, let me talk here. Hi, JP Maganito. I'm one of the medical directors at Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, I do a lot of utilization management and case reviews. So. And my name, I'm Dr. Greg Holtzman. I'm the state medical officer for the state of Montana, and I'm actually um, playing the part of Marie Matthews, who's the head of Medicaid in our department. Not that I know a lot on there, but I'm gonna do my absolute best, and I can tell you, I'll probably keep going back to my area that I feel comfortable in. I'm Claire. I'm Clara Combs. I'm an actuary at Pacific Source Health Plans. Um, my role there is to set premiums and uh, do risk analysis for individual and group health insurance products. My name is Kathy Burton. I am an independent agent. I sell health insurance for Burnham Pew Inc. in Great Falls. And my name is Dean French, and I'm the CEO of Community Medical Center here in Missoula. Uh, and I'm a family physician. Uh, who, uh, for the good of all patients in the state of Montana, no longer practices. Um, so for all of our panelists, the mm -hmm. first question we wanted to ask was, do you guys think that your members really understand how their insurance benefit works? And how do you work with them to help them understand how that benefit works so they're prepared to receive a catastrophic diagnosis like cancer? Okay. Who wants to tackle that first? Speak up real quick. So I think the first panelist kind of touched base on this a little bit. And to answer that question directly, no, most patients do not know what their insurance covers. But one of the panelists earlier had mentioned that there's two things that you should look into. One is the nurse navigator, and the other one is a case manager. Case managers, for, I can speak for obviously Blue Cross Blue Shield, we have them there. They're there, they're calling, and sometimes they don't get a call back. Um, and it's either probably because uh, the patient probably has a nurse navigator already, so they probably think, oh, we don't need a case manager. Um, although I sit in this panel right now speaking as a medical director for Blue Cross Blue Shield, I am a husband of a breast cancer survivor. So I can tell you for a fact that my wife had a call from Blue Cross Blue Shield and she ignored it. From a case management perspective, I said, like, what are you doing? Um, so that. That case manager that's in Blue Cross Blue Shield or whatever insurance company you're involved with will guide you, will help you manage through all that rigmarole, <laughs> for lack of a better term. Um, and and it's, it is because it's so complex that we have those individuals ready to go. And I'm not sure if you want to add more towards specific source there. Yeah, I mean, I, I also have the answer no. Members don't understand benefits very well. And that's not just anecdotal. These are, these are complaints that we track regularly. Members not understanding benefits is a top complaint every month. Um, which, you know, these benef benefits are complicated. And for a lot of people, you don't understand them until you have to use them. And at that point, it's very difficult to face that. And so we, we try and address this, you know, in the basics of having clear summaries. If there's a footnote that is generating a lot of complaints, we move it up to the main text so that it's not a surprise. Um, high quality customer service so that if someone calls in about a surgery benefit, we say, you know, there will also be a, there will be a facility charge and a physician charge. Do you want me to explain those benefits as well? Trying to meet meet the member at the point they're wanting to learn about the benefit. And then of course, the, the nurse case managers, who it, it's their whole goal to help you maximize your benefits, to get <laughs> high quality providers in network, to help with any prior OS, to help you understand your benefits. Because um, we acknowledge that this is complicated and they are there to streamline that side of it for someone with a critical illness. And just to add on to that a little bit more, they do track patterns right, of, of behavior patterns of difficulty that we pivot pretty quickly on changing. 
you know, certain things, pamphlets given out, calls, is it worth it, is it not? And un unless the patient themselves are the ones that are complaining or pointing those out, we won't know. Um, and, and, and that's why I love this, the first panel. I think that kind of got me a little teary-eyed because I do have a wife. But it, it, it is, it, we have to hear it. And if we, we, we don't hear it, we can't change. So. Um, <clears throat> just to add on to that, I would say no too. But I, I'll even start with my background. Um, I grew up, my dad is a physician, my um, grandfather was a physician, my uncle was a physician, my dad, my brother is almost a physician, he's a surgeon, um, <clears throat> and myself. And um, I st also studied health policy for my MPH and I don't understand it. So how, you know, my own insurance. So, you know, we have a very, very complicated system. And so I think that adds greatly to it. As far as what Medicaid does, yes, they do have some things, you know, member guides and newsletters that go out, um, direct outreach. I'm gonna talk about us as a bigger entity though. We also have public health and some of the er other areas that we do outreach in. So with those programs, um, there is some things with self-management. There's areas that we do with screening, especially on breast and cervical cancer, um, helping people um, get into the system and be able to get that kind of um, care. I think there's some changes that are happening at the national level. We always know there's changes happening at the national level. We had the patient-centered medical home and how that works. Um, now CPC Plus, some of the concepts in that is that we're actually paying the providers a little bit more money so that that outreach will happen. Uh, I think it's always a challenge and a huge bureaucracy, whether it is Blue Cross, Blue Shield, or Pacific Coast, or even the state uh, government, but is to how to get that we still need to have those conversations and try to figure out the best ways to be able to get into us to make the comments that the hardest frustration for me is always to hear about the person that has the hardest time trying to get a hold of us, which I know is a challenge sometimes. This is a challenge that I face every day when I meet with people. You say the word deductible and their eyes just kind of glaze over. And deductible is the magic word. That's the word that everyone, whether you're on employer insurance, individual insurance, doesn't matter. Everybody wants to know what their deductible is. They don't understand what coinsurance is, and they never look at maximum out of pocket. And so when I work with people, we go through the whole process. One of the best things that's come out of the Affordable Care Act, I believe, is the summary of benefits and coverage. Because now every insurer is using deductible. Well, deductible was pretty standard. At one time, Blue Cross would interchange coinsurance and copay. They're not the same. And so you can take side-by-side -side comparisons. They give you the definition, and they explain it. And that has been very helpful. My son, who works for the state of New York, sent me his policy once. He said, Mom, will you tell me about my benefits? Spent 20 minutes, got a headache, and said, no. <laughs> because they just kept sending him new documents on new documents, policies on policies, and I could not decipher it. And so that has been a great help, but getting people to want to understand that is very hard. They look at price and deductible, and employees spend five minutes choosing which plan they're going to take. Again, based on price and deductible. Can I add one, one more thing on that? Sure. Um, I do want to say, and, and maybe we can talk about this more at, at and things, but we also have to change from the other side and say as a society, what do we want to pay for? And where are we going to go? And, you know, nobody wants to pay up front, and I'm the same way. But at the same time, when these issues come along, how do we pay for that? And that there's a whole other issue that we could talk about that Dr. Ward brought up as far as profitability and what profit and how should you be able to profit and those type of things. But even the bottom line of, you know, what do we cover? What do we as a society 
want to and how should people understand that is a real big conversation that we need to have. So I'm going to direct this question at you, Kathy. Um, you are both an insurance agent and a cancer survivor. Uh, what advice would you give to someone who's been newly diagnosed, they have private insurance, and how to plan for and reduce their costs? Case management. I did not get a call from case management from Blue Cross Blue Shield. I didn't wait that long. When I got my diagnosis, I called them to find out what my options were, to see what kind of choices I was able to make. They were invaluable. And as the treatment went on, she was fabulous in helping me, convincing me to go get a second opinion to decide whether or not I should go through radiation therapy. She encouraged me to appeal a decision with Blue Cross Blue Shield. They denied a test that I had done. It was a genome test. It came back saying that I would not benefit, <coughs> excuse me, from chemotherapy. And it was denied because chemotherapy would have been okayed. And so they denied it, and she encouraged me, um, gave me some tips on how to write that appeal, and they ultimately paid for that test. But what that saved me by having that test to not have to go through chemotherapy when there would have been no benefit to it was just amazing. People do not understand billing. I would hope that I would ask everyone when they come in, I ask them to either bring me their explanation of benefits, get a family member to look at the explanation of benefits, make sure that claims are processing correctly. Don't pay the bill to any provider until you've compared it to your explanation of benefits because sometimes claims do get processed wrong and it's much easier to just wait and make sure that it has processed through your insurance right away and know that the insurance company isn't your enemy when you're going through treatment. They do have an awful lot of resources available and I felt very lucky to know about them and to be able to take full advantage of those. Thank you, Kathy. Um, Coming back to uh, reducing costs, and um, it was alluded to a little bit earlier when Greg was talking about CPC Plus. Some people think that if we bundle payments, uh, that that is, holds out promise for reducing costs. Are any of you as insurance providers using bundling uh, for cancer care? And if so, is it having the intended effect? JP, you want to start? Or? You know, currently we are looking into that. Um, like anything else, if you make too much of a drastic change, then people tend to panic. Um, and, and a part of Dr. Bryan's talk earlier is, is reference pricing, right? It, it's difficult to know what an episode is when you don't know when someone may pass away or may need certain treatments and things like that. So for now, yes, and I can, I can tell you we are looking at it actively. Um, there are certain things that we have for lack of a better term, have kind of given it a name of limited bundling, in which there's still points of um, reimbursements that could change as the care changes. Um, because we do recognize that not one person is the same as the next cancer patient. So. For Medicaid, it's actually fairly easy. We don't. Um, so it's right now it's still fee for service. There's, you know, bundling an OB or something of that sort, but not in cancer care. Uh, we at Pacific Service think there's a lot of value in bundle payment, um, so you can lower costs without sacrificing quality. And we've been experimenting with them over the few, last few years, but the, most of our bundling is with orthopedic care, and we're looking how to expand that to other care, um, as well as other um, fee for service alternatives. Uh, specific to cancer and not looking for ways that can bring overall costs down for all of our members. 
What, what are the biggest challenges, you know, you mentioned orthopedics. What, what's the biggest challenges that you see in, in getting a bundle put together? Um, one, one issue with bundling care is it can lead to a lot of, um, and I'm not an expert in this, but talking to people in providing at work, it can lead to a lot of manual work. And so we're trying to figure out um, better ways to do it so that it really is efficient when you um, expand it. And then also, you, you, with any payment model, you want to make sure you are continuing to incentivize quality. You don't want to just um, have someone try and cut, you know, qu cut quality to make it cheaper. And so um, make sure quality incentives are built into the contract. Um, yeah. Okay. JP, any thoughts on what the biggest yeah. challenges are? I, I think that she hit it on the nail there, right? It's it's no one's the same <laughs> and it's very difficult in, in bundling things because then one provider might be doing high quality care and now you're not incentivizing them then what's the point in them seeing more patients right so there's there's all those different kinds of issues that we're well aware of and, and I'm sure patients are well aware of as well so I think it's just a matter of figuring out little by little which works and, and so similarly with Pacific Source our first few steps are ortho because those are fairly um, well, what's that word I'm trying to think of fairly um, predictable um, care so let's see what happens with that and then we'll roll it over to something else and then something else um, and you know there's there's some of um, some of the things I hear on, on at work is well now you're gonna be looking at transparency issues right whether or not something costs certain things versus another um, and sometimes there's shame in showing which ones get better care than not, and then other providers step up suddenly. So um, there's just so many issues going on, but the biggest thing is really um, whether or not um, that bundling will pay back what the kind of care that the patient gives. And that's a difficult thing to answer. Um, the the uh, cost of cancer uh, report showed that cancer patient costs drastically spike. Is there any methodologies as payers that you have been looking at to try to spread that initial big burden of cost out so it isn't hitting patients all at the front end of their diagnosis? Uh, I, I mean, there, there are some basic mechanisms for spreading out the cost. There's um, health saving vehicles, HSA, HRA. Um, which can have tax benefits and, for example, then FSA, if you um, elect that deduction, that, that money's all available on January 1. Um, that doesn't cover the whole population. Not everyone has access to these <coughs> sorts of vehicles. Um, other ways you can buy a plan with a lower deductible, which comes with a higher premium and smooths out of the year, or you can... Um, you know, it, a lot, we can put the out of pocket maximum, say, you know, the ACA put it at, I can't remember what it is this year, 7350. No plan can charge more for that. That spreads the cost versus five years ago when an out of pocket maximum could be $10,000. So um, th there are different ways to get there. A lot of them have an overlay with regulation, with um, tax regulation, subsidies that make those plans more available. And so it's, um, kind of a complicated answer from just the insurer side. There's a lot of overlapping areas. Um, nothing else to add, I think. <laughs> you got it. It's very, very complicated. Right? We're governed by laws, and, and, and that's a huge part of why we need to make some of those changes. Medicaid is just a different beast a little bit in this. Um, one, there's limited... Uh, cost sharing that is, is required in that and also there's a limit of 5% of your income so that kind of helps in, in those areas obviously we're talking with people that have a lot more less disposable income the challenge also we talked about getting people on Medicaid and there's two comments that were made um, earlier Medicaid is a very interesting insurance it's the only one that I know that does this and if I say this wrong, just correct me because I'm not sure the number of months, but I'm pretty sure it's once you get on, they'll back pay for three months. That's not done by any other insurance kind of thing. So there's this aspect also of, you know, kind of going in and, and, and going back in there. So um, again, it's a slightly different population, um, but th there is a little bit more control on the cost of 
out of pocket? What I've seen this year in the individual market is that we do now have some bronze plans, which are your cheaper plans because of the actuarial value. But in previous years, those started at $5,000, $6,000 going forward. And this year, those deductibles are now down at $2,200. 2400 and then you've got coinsurance spreading it out <clears throat> but how many people i mean it is a problem because deductibles come out of your pocket first and there's just no way to ease that unless you go with a really low deductible um, in the individual market the lowest is 450 dollars but the cost of that plan is enormous High deductible plans with HSAs, our problem is the people who buy those, that's stretching their budget. They don't have the money to put into an HSA. And so some type of arrangement needs to be made with the providers to help ease that deductible so that they're not making the demand for that payment immediate. If you've got the providers helping them spread that out, then that gives them some cushion. But your initial costs are always going to happen at the front end. Are there any uh, legal challenges with the providers um, delaying, because I think that's what you just said, essentially delaying <laughs> demand on payment on the front end? Actually, the laws changed a few years ago. Um, with the bankruptcy laws that now allow hospitals to garnish wages, um, go after payment much sooner than before. Before they used to, if you were making regular payments, they had to accept those payments. That's no longer the case. You now get turned over to creditors very, very quickly if you're not making those payments and you cannot get other help. And another thing that I've seen happen is it's called care credit, where they're encouraging you to put that on a credit card and you get six months to pay that same as cash. What people don't realize, though, that under the new bankruptcy laws, as soon as you put that bill on care credit, it's no longer a medical expense that's easy to write off in bankruptcy. It's now a credit card debt, and those are much harder to get rid of in bankruptcy. And I guess my question was a, that, but a little different. If under high deductible savings accounts, there's an IRS protection there for that money to be pre-tax, if a provider with basically withholds billing until they've met their deductible, is that somehow violating the IRS rules? Not to my knowledge. Okay. So prevention is often discussed as a strategy to uh, address costs. How do you guys encourage your members to uh, reduce their risks? How do they? How do you encourage prevention? Um, we we do preventive reminders for HPV vaccines, well woman visits, um, cancer screenings, and send, try and send reminders, especially when someone looks like they've had a gap in care and need a preventive screening. Um, and then probably most important with that, almost all of these things are covered at no cost to the member so that that's not a barrier to getting um, your regular exam and a colorectal, co uh, sorry, cancer screenings, breast cancer screenings, cervical cancer screenings. Um, we also try and promote general wellness. We have an online portal to you know eat fit, eat well, get fit, these kind of things to just trying to find ways to promote general wellness in a way that's really effective and can change members. Um, we also try to approach it from the provider side, 
letting the letting primary care doctors know which one of their patients um, maybe has a has doesn't appear to have had a cervical cancer screening when maybe they should so that um, the the primary care a primary care doctor doesn't necessarily know everything that goes on maybe they had one somewhere else and so um, we as the insurer have that type of data and so we can tell the primary care doctor when they have a patient that um, looks like they're due for a screening. So as far as, you know, there's things in Blue Cross, for example, as far as incentivizing patients to be healthier. But I think the overall kind of catapult with Blue Cross Blue Shield right now is something called total health management, where really it's kind of that next step, right? Really a total fundamental change in the way we monitor providers monitoring patients. Meaning, I'm sure you guys have heard, if not, have heard of CPC Plus or, or Patient Care Medical Home or value-based care, right? You incentivize providers with the, just the average to meet the standards of care to prevent certain diseases. I think we mentioned cervical cancer, colon cancer, and things like that. We are now moving towards that, meaning or if not, we have already kind of moved towards that, but we actually have an entire department that's geared towards looking at the data, telling providers what the patients need, or if they have missed a cervical cancer screening, that they, we will call them and say, we may want to call. Um, and, and so a part of that whole um, um, impetus is, is also the, the health information exchange, right? We're one place where you can get information that we're helping out with the Billings Clinic. Um, so. We are, we're getting there. We are there. We are getting to a, to a better place. Um, but we are trying to ch really fundamentally change that theory of really trying to almost force providers to say, hey, look, you need to meet at the very least the average hemoglobin A1C for diabetics or the yearly screening for whatever cancer. And we're almost to the point where we're forcing them because it is the average. <laughs> we should be at the very least the average. But it's a really kind of an exciting time, and that's where it's kind of growing for at Blue Cross. So, and we've had really good data now to show that it is worth it. It is saving care, saving money, decreasing incidence. Um, yeah. I'm going to apologize up front. I'm going to kind of get on my high horse here for a second. Um, so a couple things, uh, and I'm going to take it from what Dr. Ward talked about. He said, I'm just going to use last century. It was 47 at the turn of last century. It was the average lifespan at the turn of the 2000. It was 77 higher in some populations, lower than the other. So 30 years of extra life. About 25 of those years are due to public health. Um, so we're talking about prevention and using evidence-based prevention. When you look at the ACA, and I don't want to get into the politics of the ACA or not, but just one aspect, not all insurance companies were covering these things prior to that. Now it's mandated that all A and B um, U.S. Preventive Service Task Force recommendations have to be covered. So that has made a difference with, um, you know, breast cancer screening, making a difference, taking away that issue of trying to get into access and cost with no copay uh, along with that allowed. So colonoscopies, which was more of a challenge with some of the areas. So that was another one. And even every, everything has to be caught paid for with no copay for immunizations, too, that have been approved by the uh, Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. So here's your HPV vaccine and even your hepatitis B vaccine, which also is preventing uh, hepatocellular cancer down the line. So these things have all are really good ways that we can make a difference. We also, again, have to be as a society, and I'm going to say something that I'm saying from my point because my boss is in the room, and if she decides that this, I wasn't supposed to say this, but it's a passion of mine. Um, tobacco, if we look at that, that cost, I think Medicaid, it's $440 million a year that we pay in costs secondary to tobacco, um, the cost to society. I 100% agree that we should help the people that are smokers who want to quit, quit. Um, and 70% of them do, and we should be putting all our efforts to try and help those people. But the 30% who decide to continue to smoke, I think it's their right to make that decision, but they're not paying near into it of what the actual cost is. A pack of cigarettes costs society about $19.16. Um, so this is another way that we can make a big difference. Um, if 
I know that there's revenue issues at the state, but I'm not talking about it for that reason at all. I'm talking about it as making a difference in the number of kids who start smoking and making a difference in cancer rates and other health issues down the line. Um, I do feel very strongly that smokers, somebody else said this, it's not my quote, but I like it. Smokers aren't bad people with a bad habit. They're good people with a difficult addiction and we should be there to help them. Well, I'm gonna get on that same horse. <laughs> good, thank you. So as a, as a clinician, really, you know, ACA did a huge amount of good and, sh and should continue to do so. Medicaid expansion is doing a lot of good. We should continue to do so. So, I, I, and I see it, I saw it as a clinician and then going into the insurance side of things, I felt I had to make that move because I, I did have a public health background and a healthcare administration background, but I felt I needed to focus because doing both is not, you know, it's not a good thing. But now I'm understanding it more and now I appreciate all of it, um, and, and, and I do. So I, I wanna get into that horse with you and, and say yes, ACA is good for access. Access is number one. Take that away, then we're talking about a higher cost. I think preventive is a really tough word to describe because there are a lot of preventive services that are covered at 100%, but there's an awful lot of those that are not, and people do put those off. Colonoscopy, it, once they find polyps, they want to in every five years, but now it's no longer a preventive service. It's because you've had a medical diagnosis and you have to pay for that. I have a friend and she has not gone in. She's got implants just like I do. They're supposed to be, I'm supposed to have an MRI every two years so they can check those implants. She has had one in eight years because of the cost. Even though it's preventive, she would have to She's got high deductible. She would have to pay the full cost of that. So she, like many people, puts off services until she's actually had to hit a deductible for something else. Then they go and they get everything done in the year because now it's free. And so, oh geez, my knee's hurting, so I'm gonna go get my knee replaced because I can get it for free. And as long as I'm doing that, I might as well have them check this out as well. Oh, sorry. And so, some of our problems with the insurance, and I don't know how to fix it, but maybe have specific co-pays for certain procedures that people really do need to encourage them to go in, that makes it a lot more complicated. It's already a complicated product, but how do we make sure that people are going in for these services that they need? Can you afford to go have that colonoscopy every five years? Well, what if I just wait a year? You know, things are tough this year. Groceries have gone up, gas prices have gone up, I think I'm gonna wait. And I don't know how the insurance companies resolve that, but that's one of the complaints I always hear is like, well, they didn't pay for it, it's preventive. Preventive is a really, um, not a good word to use because a lot of medicine that we do is preventive, but it's not free. Thank you. So last question, uh, what state or federal policies uh, do you think would help reduce the cost of cancer care? That's an easy one, right? Oh. <laughs> um, I'll go, I, I say, three core things. I would say uh, prevention, and I would say it in primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention, so what you're, you're talking about here, so I'm not sure if everybody knows the, those definitions, but primary prevention is preventing something before it ever happens, so that's gonna be your immunizations or healthy diet, exercise, stuff of that sort. Secondary prevention is trying to find something early so you can change the out course, so these are gonna be your mammograms um, or colonoscopies. Uh, and then tertiary prevention is once something is diagnosed, trying to prevent the con consequences of that, so maybe diabetes management, et cetera. So I think we need to be looking at prevention in different ways. It still costs, but I mean, we have, that's something, a society question of how we have to pay for it. Um, but I, I definitely agree with that. Second, I think research is real important. 
of where we go, uh, to what is successful, what is not, putting in clinical trials, but figuring out how we do that so we are actually paying for things that work. We have to do clinical trials to learn, but what we actually start to pay for, and we've had mistakes before, like all that happened with breast cancer and the um, bone marrow transplants, which ended up costing, I'm not talking financially, which it did cost a lot, but it cost a lot in human lives too, so that aspect. And then lastly, and I think you've covered all these things today, but counseling and real patient-centeredness so that people can talk with the patient and the patient really understands their prognosis, what options are available to them, and they make the decision that fits best for them. Sadly, a year and a half ago, I lost my father to cancer. And, um, you know, I'm going to quote you, Dr. Ward, again. Cancer sucks. But if there's a way of death, it, was, it could not have been more beautiful. We kept him at home the whole time. Um, my brother, sister, I, and one of our cousins was around the, uh, switched off the time, and we were able to do it because there was such great hospice care, and it was exactly what he wanted. So um, I think that's real important, too, to bring down cost for both emotionally, again, and, and financial. So I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. So what state or federal policy gets us there? <clears throat> I think, again, we have to decide how we're, as a community, as a population, we have to decide how we're going to pay for things. That's something we have never decided. Uh, nobody wants to pay extra taxes, but we do want things to come in, and we have to decide where that's going to go. I do think there's a difference between insurance and what we call prevention. Um, insurance are things like car insurance, where I'm never... I don't want to get in a car accident, but if that happened, I would have some things. I'm, there's nothing I'm going to do. For me to have insurance for glasses right now is not insurance. You know I'm going to have to use that. So I think some policy changes that we put in money, this is my personal opinion, so don't go with the state on this because they might completely disagree, uh, but I would like to see that we have a core amount of money that we actually pay for prevention, that we all put our money in for primary and some secondary prevention. So there is no cost uh, for the individual. Um, they pay for it other ways, but we help each other out for immunizations, for uh, screenings like we're doing A and B, and I would argue that once you're found, that's still screening for uh, looking for polyps later, but that's where I would say, but we still have to decide as a society if that's what we want to do as a group. I think that was a great answer. I mean, I, I do think of this in two, um, kind of in two pieces. There is uh, cost shifting. You can limit a drug copay, and that makes it easier for the member who has that drug to fill, but that shifts the remainder of the costs um, back into premium for everyone else. And so that is a social political discussion that needs to be had of what is appropriate there and then separately um i hope we could agree a bit more on things that can actually lower costs would be great to invest in um preventive care um access to healthy food all you know all of these kinds of really um that might fundamentally lower costs would be excellent and then one i mean one that's probably a bit more direct as an insurer is um funding research we want to make the best, most informed decisions for our members, and um, there's a lot of new, exciting research going on in cancer right now, and we, we want to make the, the best decisions for our members, and we, we need the data to do that. I'd like to say, can I say, have a little time to say a little more? Sure. Okay. <laughs> Don't want to steal things here from anything. Um, but it, I think that's the question that we really, as a society, we won't, we haven't, wanting to have that discussion. And I think that's come up a couple times today. Um, we were talking afterwards about the comments of should insurance pay for experimental medications? Um, okay, that's that would be fine, but then once the drugs come out, does that mean that the drug companies charge less? You know, does it, where does that profit go? Somebody brought up a really good question: Is there a difference between private health insurance, a private hospital, and public hospital, or private insurance and public hospital? And my argument back to that is, 
Probably not, because they have to play in the same sandbox. So when we used to do what they called community rating, let's say Missoula, the community rating, they decided it cost people $300 a year. So the insurance company knew that the miners cost 400, you know, the university cost 300, and the school teachers cost, you know, 200. They'd make it 300, and that would be for it. Then public, a private insurance comes on and they say, well, we can make it cheaper. And they take the, the lower cost people come over to that private insurance um, because it's a lower cost for them, but it makes the cost go up for everybody else in the community rating. So pretty soon, even though they're a public, they have to do the same thing. They're playing in the same sandbox, otherwise their costs are going to go up. So there are things that we as a society have to decide what rules do we want to put around this game. Very, one thing from government side that's really challenging, and there's always ways to improve, and I think we always need to be shooting for that, but have a pot of money in front of you and decide, how do I best spend it? Because it is a pot of money. There's only so much that can go around. How do we decide who gets that? Is it the person in most need? Is it the one that we get the best value in um, that by paying up front? Is it the one who has the best lobbyist? I mean, these are the things that we, as a society, really need to go back and decide. And then some of these other questions come on, to, on the bottom of that, or top of that. Any other comments? Okay. You mentioned uh, the cost of drugs and, and the shifting. And we know that the cost of chemotherapeutics are, are higher. And so um, there's a program called the 340B program which uh, is constantly appears to be under fire. Is that a federal or state policy that should be looked at to lower the cost of chemotherapeutics? I don't understand the whole financing behind. I know how we use it, and I would probably call a friend if she has answered, Jessica or Sheila, would you have answers on that one, on the 340B? It's, it's a federal program that allows providers in, in to offer lower cost, you know, prescription drugs to, to, to serve needy populations. And I think that that program is critical, especially in rural states like Montana, um, to, to continuing. Um, and I think, um, you know, the, I, and I hope that Congress, you know, reaches out to rural states like ours um, to hear more about how important that is um, to the ability to, to lower the cost of health care for the people who need it most. So this is my clever segue to the audience question and answer section. Um, so we'll open it up. Does anybody have a question? I, I have one. Okay. And it's kind of a follow-up to the prescription drug discussion. Um, obviously, when um, the insurance companies file their rates on an annual basis, at least in the last couple of years, it's shown that the biggest cost of increases in premiums is from cost of care and pharmaceuticals, pharmaceuticals being the biggest cost driver. So back to the original question, what can we do at the federal level in particular to make sure that we're bringing down the cost of those pharmaceuticals. Right. Um, I, I am aware there is a proposal in Oregon where the state tried to um, essentially say that drugs in Oregon were not going to cost more than, I believe it was the average price the next three industrial nations pay. Um, I don't know if there's a future in something like that. It certainly didn't pass in Oregon, but um, drug costs are by far, I mean, the, the costs of drugs are far outpacing um, the medical inflation that we see. So, I mean, that's absolutely true. Um, and if we could find a way to cap that, that would be, that would be a huge savings, which would become premium relief, um, state fund relief. Uh, yeah, drug costs are, a big issue that should be addressed. I'm not sure how. Out on the um, marketplace, there is no prescription drug card available unless you buy a gold plan. So you have to meet the deductible first, and then you will get some cost sharing. And so individuals who are buying drugs out 
in the individual market no longer have the zero dollar copay for the preventive or the five dollar generics they're going to be they get the advantage of the discounts that the insurers do but the insurers the insurance companies are having to do that to control costs and currently we as a nation have decided that we are not going to regulate pharmaceutical companies and it's my personal belief that the pharmaceutical companies may topple our system as we know it. The increases in insulin, I mean, I have clients who are spending thousands of dollars a month on insulin. Insulin isn't brand new. It's been around for a long, long time. How, until we as a nation decide that we're not going to accept that any longer, this is what we've got, and we're just going to continue to see the prices go up. We're going to see um, people cutting their drugs in half. When Medicare Part D came out, I thought it was the best thing that ever happened. I didn't realize how many of my clients were splitting their drugs. I thought, oh, this is going to be great. Every year, the, the amount that those costs are going up, the deductible, the uh, maximum before they get to catastrophic. If you're on a fixed income, they're not splitting pills anymore. They're just not taking them because they cannot afford it. The Part D drug card itself isn't that expensive, but the cost sharing, it's just, you know, I haven't seen it it stop and it's really tough when somebody's sitting across from you and they're crying because they they don't have money to get the drugs that they need to be alive and there's only so much that I can do and there's only so much the insurance companies can do to help them with that I would echo a lot of that I think the fact that we can't negotiate with Part D is you know crazy that's my opinion again uh, so that I think plays an, a real big aspect and we need to look at those kind of costs I think we need to also look at effectiveness better and being able to pay for uh, what medications do work well and I think there's some aspects in research that we should be concerned about because we see a lot of the me too drugs continuing to be um, there's benefit to be new hypertension medicine because you're going to take it for the rest of your life and these things. But while we're having huge troubles in the antibiotic world, um, people aren't spending money on that for the research because there's no profit because you take that for 10 days and it's over and yet we're going to have some problems down the line. So there is some um, population-based concerns that we need to look at as society now or we will pay. Um, later. Okay. Um, just just a, a couple points. One, I wanted to come back to the cigarette smoking piece. Um, I think we all know how bad it is, but I, um, there was an article published several years ago in, in our premier medical journal that looked at simply survival of smokers versus non-smokers in the current era with all our advanced medical treatments. And on average, smokers lose 11 to 12 years off their life compared to non-smokers. So if you think about the average life expectancy, that comes to about one day per every week you smoke. So every week you smoke, you're losing a day off your life, about one-seventh of your life. So I think if you know anybody who smokes, it might be an interesting statistic to share with them. The, the other piece, and it gets back to something I was involved in previously, and that is Again, the importance of moving, moving things forward in terms of our, our ability to treat and, uh, and how that relates to, to drug costs and drug development. Um, one of the reasons it is so expensive for, for new drugs to come into the system is it, it is really costly. And I'm not defending the pharmaceutical industry because I have a lot of problems with the way they run their business and some of the stuff that goes on. But it takes, on average, about 10 years once a drug kind of begins to percolate into the system as something that might be useful until it gets to FDA approval, and there's only a small percentage of them that do. 
one of the reasons it takes so long is it takes numbers. And overall, 3% of cancer patients nationwide participate in clinical trials. It takes a long time to generate numbers when you don't have participation. So uh, something else I would kind of make a point for, that potentially could bring down the cost, although I think it's only one aspect of the problem. And I think that's probably enough for me. I'm sorry, we're out of time. <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah, sorry, got to go. <laughs> I have two comments and then maybe three comments. First of all, I heard on the news the other day that this company, and I don't remember which one it was or where it is, that if you are a non-smoker, you get five more days vacation than the smokers because they have to take breaks all the time to go have their cigarettes. So I'm like, yes, I don't <laughs> smoke. I know that. Can I have five more days? There are non-smoking campus. <laughs> this is true. Uh, well, there's people who still smoke there. Uh, and then second, when you said everybody just wants to know what their deductible is, they want to know what their out-of-pocket is. I talk to them every day, and it's like, what's my total out-of-pocket? Yeah, I so. always, they always say, what's my deductible? Really? Because you yes. got to hit your deductible before you hit your out-of-pocket. Well, and they think that so. I've hit my deductible, I'm done. Yeah, it's, a lot of them do. Yes. Yeah, you're right, so you have to yes. explain that to them. Yes, yeah, I and do then that a lot. My last one is yesterday I had a patient in my office that brought in all her EOBs, and she wanted to know why some things were being denied. And so we looked back and seen it, well, it was bundled with another service. And she goes, well, what does that mean? I said, they're saying that we shouldn't charge for this, that they're bundling it or making it inclusive to another charge. She goes, then why are you guys charging me for it? And I'm like, um, I don't know, we'll go talk to Susan. <laughs> <laughs> so it's hard, you know, when they come in with their EOBs and they want you to explain this, and it's like, well, the doctor's saying you need this, but the insurance company's saying that we shouldn't just put it in with this other charge, so. I did not have a good answer for her. Is that a question? Yeah. No. <laughs> I would like to know what I could tell the patients. <laughs> they, they can, no question is a bad question. I, I, I mean, I look at my own EOBs and have a question and I go get it answered. It, this, it's, I think people can be intimidated by how complicated it is, but that should not stop you from making sure it's right and trying to understand that it, it's, it's mistakes get made or if something doesn't look right to you or it's confusing, absolutely ask a question. Um, we will answer it. I think one of the hard problems in answering questions about EOBs or somebody wants to know why they're being charged is being able to tactfully tell them, well, you're going to have to pay for this. Um, and that's taken me a while um, with all the years that I've done it. Sometimes we do just have to give them the bad news. Yes, you owe this. I'm sorry you didn't know that doctor was not in your network. You are going to have to pay the difference or you can call and see if they'll negotiate. And it's never a fun thing to do, but I think I've learned being direct and just trying to, you know, just say I'm sorry, but you do owe this charge is really helpful. It's always much more fun to say, oh, they messed up, let me fix it for you. But sometimes I do have to give bad news. I'm sorry, you're going to have to pay this. As a physician, just putting on that hat and seeing patients, it's really challenging too, because you would get those questions all the time, how much is this gonna cost? And I don't know, you know, I might send them out and have them talk with our, you know, administrator that can kind of go and look and see if they can get an answer beforehand. But you're trying to do what you feel is what is the best and talking it over with them and seeing what fits into their, um, their wishes. But it's really, really challenged when you have all these different insurance companies and all these different rules for whatever one you're going with. Okay, I'm going to have to limit the questions. Um, 
I wanted to give the panelists an opportunity to sum up if they had any closing thoughts. And why don't we go ahead and start with you, Catherine? Mm -hmm. I hear a lot and read a lot on my Facebook blogs about how bad the insurance companies are and that they're horrible and they're making all this money and they don't care about the people that they are insuring. And I guess I would just have to say that insurance companies really are not the bad guys. Um, and rules, the law is limiting what they can earn. And my experience in working with them and having access to the people who work for them is they go out of their way. Um, both these companies here have gone out of their way for my clients and to help me help them and to make sure that they get the best care that's possible. They do better if you do better. And so I think they just have to be considered a partner and don't be afraid to reach out to them. If you have access, use an agent. We have a lot of access. We know the right questions to ask. Again, we don't always get the answer you may want to hear, but the agents I know really do go above and beyond to answer service questions whenever they can. We look at EOBs, we help you get claims paid. We are here to help you um, get the best care and to get the best service out of your health insurance. Um, I teach a little insurance 101 for new employees and we go over insurance is intended to cover the financial burden of unexpected, catastrophically expensive events. You have um, homeowner's insurance for a fire, you have uh, car insurance for a car accident, and you have health insurance for a catastrophic treatment. Like This is exactly what we are here for, and we want the best possible care for our members. Uh, we also have a fiduciary responsibility to spend the premium of our members appropriately, and I don't think those are goals that have to be in conflict. We, um, we want to find the best ways to get the safest, most effective care um, that's high quality and best for our members. And I apologize, we're going to have to wrap it up. So is there any really juicy kernels or pearls that either of you have? I'm sure JP does. Oh, no, I'm good. Okay. <laughs> I'd like to thank I'm our panel. I'm on his horse, remember. <laughs> okay. I'd just like to thank our panelists. Thank you. Okay. okay, if we could gather around again. This is a panel that I've been really excited to hear from <laughs> oh, great. when I saw what was going on. Now we're going to take a look at through the policy lens. And Michael Foster, who's a lobbyist for the Catholic hospitals and a former legislator, is our facilitator for this panel. So I'll let you take, take it, it over. Away. All right, well, thank you. And you can call me Mike. Um, so we, we are very uh, gifted today to have such a great panel. And um, in fact, not only do we have two legislators, but we have two very key, very knowledgeable legislators. And they are both heading to Helena uh, when we're done here. So we're going to stay on time to make sure that they can maximize some daylight and hopefully some dry roads or drier. Senator Cafaro had some rough roads today. Um, so anyway, I'm going to let the panelists introduce themselves. Um, you know, I can tell you that Jessica Rhodes here is the governor's health care policy advisor. She's been doing a, a great job. She knows an awful lot about health care and health care policy. So we appreciate her coming here today, Jess, and, and, um, and sharing all your great knowledge and uh, Representative Nancy Balance from Hamilton. She is the chair of the House Appropriations Committee. That's the money, folks. And <laughs> um, so I, I just can't thank Nancy enough for coming today. Uh, Senator Mary Cafaro is a longtime legislator who 
has distinguished yourself as a true expert on health and human services funding and programs. And uh, if you ever uh, want to meet a true champion of the poor and the vulnerable, it's Senator Mary Farrell. So, and Kristen Page Nye, well, she's the boss here, right? <laughs> and um, actually, she, she did a ton of work to put this conference together, and so I think she just... <laughs> So before we get to the elephant in the room, which is, of course, the special session, um, I, I want to hear from the panelists their impressions of what they heard today. So um, thank you, Mike. And it's, it's a great honor to be on such a distinguished uh, panel. Um, I want to start uh, by passing on uh, thanks uh, from Governor Bullock uh, for Kristen Page and I, not just for the excellent work to put this together, but for all of the great information that she has provided to him and to our office over the years. Um, she is always available 24-7 uh, to answer tough questions, to give advice, um, to provide some of the best research um, that we've received. And so thank you for your expertise and, and for your partnership from him. Um, this uh, has been a tremendous uh, conference and, and there were several things you know that really uh, struck me um, today and the first thing I have to say is, is that the cost of care um, especially the cost of care um, for patients um, is one of the most critical issues that's facing um, us as a, as a nation um, and certainly uh, as a state. Um, Out-of-pocket costs uh, have gone up, um, deductibles have gone up uh, over the years, and um, we, we are in a time right now where um, many of the policy decisions that we're seeing um, from uh, the federal level um, are, will only uh, serve to drive uh, costs up. Um, different policies uh, such as uh, high deductible health plans, uh, uh, policies that would uh, destabilize the individual market, um, the, the policies that refused to fund um, the cost sharing reductions in the Affordable Care Act, which um, actuaries say could drive up costs up to 20 percent uh, on average. Um, uh, proposals which would cut uh, Medicaid 40%. Uh, uh, um, it's the cap and cut or block grant program would, would represent a 30 to 40% cut uh, for Medicaid uh, in our state. And so we really are facing um, critical times in terms of how to control um, health care costs and, and how to prevent cost increases that impact uh, people and patients. Um, here in Montana, we are doing some uh, innovative things to uh, work on bringing health care costs down, make he health care uh, more delivery, more efficient, and improve um, the quality of health care for people. And um, St. Patrick Hospital and the Providence Network and, and others here have, have been a part of that. Um, Montana uh, has a, a, a multi-payer task force called the Governor's Council on Healthcare Reform. It includes representatives from Pacific Source, from the co-op, from Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, and from Medicaid, public health experts, healthcare providers. And the efforts uh, that that group uh, has launched um, are, are, are really starting to pay off now. Um, thanks to um, Montana's uh, sort of building blocks from the Patient-Centered Medical Home Program, Montana uh, was able to um, build a public-private partnership with Medicare, uh, with Medicaid, uh, with Blue Cross and Pacific Source and, and now Allegiance uh, called the Comprehensive Primary Care Program to really um, incentivize uh, payment for quality instead of payment for volume. And it's our um, experience with the Patient-Centered Medical Home Program to be able to show that all of our payers could work well together that allowed us to be part of America's largest ever of its kind uh, healthcare payment reform effort. Uh, we had to have a critical mass of patients in order to be able to do that and so um, the 
Medicaid said, you know what, we're going to be a catalyst for health care reform in our state. And they stepped up to the plate to join Medicare and the private payers and made this happen for Montana. And um, so Director Hogan really deserves a round of applause for continuing that and, and, and overseeing uh, its launch earlier this year. Um, and uh, so even though we are facing try, you know, trying times, both with the special session and, and um, at the federal level, um, we're going to move forward with key health care reform for our state, and I look forward to working with all of you to do that. I, too, want to say uh, thank you for the invitation to be here today. You know, you come in thinking that you have kind of heard it all over the years, and, and yet there are many, many things that you take away from something like this. I had uh, pages of things that I wrote down. Um, but there are a couple things that occur to me that I, that I think are really important. First of all, I, I hold a very firm belief that um, a state like Montana and health care in a state like Montana, where we have a million people, is very different from health care in a state like California or Pennsylvania or Florida, New York. And we need that recognition of our uh, not only our, our providers, but our um, the way we handle delivery, uh, it's, it, the whole cost model changes when you're dealing with a million people versus some of these, uh, and I think uh, Jessica put it very well, some of these top-down programs that come from Washington, D.C. may seem like a good idea from the ma majority of states that voted for them, but, uh, but something that's created kind of a one-size-all for 300 million people just doesn't work very well in a state like Montana where we have a million people. Uh, one of the first conversations I ever had with, uh, with Jessica was, was over that very topic and, and we were trying to find, I specifically was working on some things to um, try and make that recognition and maybe bring some of that authority back to Montana. Uh, I still believe there may be some ways to do that and we need to continue to work on it. Um, but some specific takeaways for me today, uh, first of all, that eye drop thing, you know, <laughs> I can't get that out of my head. I thought it was just me that, you know, putting the eye drops in and half of it's running down my face. But uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Ward, I'll have that in my head from now on. So, uh, but, but I think, you know, we talk about things like ignorance and the cost of ignorance, and yet, we continue to take something like uh, what was called a snail cancer, I think, which is this slow-moving, non-progressive cancer, but we still call it cancer, even though we know that it freaks people out. So why, why don't we address the obvious and just change the name? Stop calling it cancer. You know, if, if that is truly an issue, there is very little cost, in my opinion, to doing that versus the additional cost of having people freak out and go to the extremes. And I've witnessed it myself with, with family members who go to extremes, even though they're told this is not life-threatening, you will die of old age before this ever, ever affects you. So, uh, you know, to me, there are such obvious answers sitting right in front of us that we do not take advantage of. Uh, the other thing that I, that I take away from today is this recognition of self-care. We as Republicans, and yes, I am a Republican if you, <laughs> if you didn't know that, um, we, we always talk about personal responsibility. But too often, you know, we say the words and we quickly translate that to mean, well, you have to put some skin in the game. You know, you need to also be responsible for understanding these things that we can't explain to you, but it's your responsibility. I, you know, I would turn that around a bit, and I would say that the healthcare systems and things like Medicaid and Medicare, which are clearly one size fits all, if you have never been to a Medicare wellness exam, you just have not lived because, because the questions they ask you, you say, how in the world could you even be asking me this? You're looking right at me, you know I'm a female. Um, so, you know, it's, um, unless we recognize people who do take care of themselves and do it in ways that make them less of a risk, 
and stop treating them all the same, then we're not going to make the progress that we need to. So I, I think that's something that really hit home to me today, and I think that we can make some progress on. And then the fourth thing that I just wanted to mention is, again, one of those, how do we overlook the obvious, but uh, insurance, we complain about people not knowing insurance and not being able to understand insurance. How long has insurance been around? I spent 40 years in information technology and 20 of that was in an insurance slash financial services company. And we have made the explanation of insurance so difficult and the details underneath it so difficult. And it doesn't need to be that way. That's another cheap, solvable problem that we just keep complaining about. It's like the weather. We complain about it, but we don't do anything about it. So I, I think we need to make hay over these things that are easy to do, that are cheap, get them behind us, and then you can spend the energy focusing on the hard stuff like cancer research. So thank you for having me, Kristen, inviting me to be here, and thank you all for being here, and thank you to St. Pat's for um, having these nice accommodations. I'm sorry I wasn't here this morning for the patient panel, and I'm sorry I wasn't, I just got a little bit of the provider panel. I was on bad roads, and I decided to pull over and have breakfast at um, Avon instead of tackling more roads, but I really wish I had been here for the patient panel. So my takeaway, I'll start with the last panel, um, Dr. Holzman, my takeaway of course was <laughs> prevention, prevention, prevention. I love those three tiers of prevention. And I love it because health care is health care. <laughs> we focus on things other than what the words say. It's about health and it's about caring for our own health. And I think that those three prevention tiers were really stood out to me, and the fact that we can take better care of ourselves, we can lower our um, cholesterol and, and lose, you know, keep your weight down and exercise and not smoke all of those things. And I just love the uh, focus on prevention and then, of course, Tobacco tax. I, I, I love that you brought up um, tobacco tax and how much tobacco use costs the state of Montana in health care. So if we want to bring down the cost of health care, less people should smoke or use other tobacco products or e-cigarettes. And one way we know to do that and to do that successfully is to raise the cost of tobacco. And he said $440 million a year and $80 million, I think, of that is Medicaid. And so better health, kids don't start, and um, it brings down the overall cost of health care. So there are, those two ideas were awesome, amongst many other things that were said by that panel. And then uh, Dr. Ward's presentation during the lunch hour, when somebody asked the question about why is it that the United States pays twice the rate for insurance as other nations, I believe your answer was something about I, I, I don't remember what your answer was. I caught some of it, but what stood out to me was somebody asked about insurance and you said no, um, it doesn't have anything to do with insurance. They're, they're not that profitable. And so I brought up an article um, from August 5th, 2017, CNBC. It, the title is Health Insurance Profits Soar. As Obamacare twists and political wins, top insurers made six billion, six billion, not that there's anything wrong with that, in parentheses. And uh, number one, all six of the top insurers are seeing their stocks hit all-time highs. Last summer, they hit all-time highs. Number two, up more than 29% in the same quarter last year. So within a quarter, their profits went up 29%. Number three, these rates are far outpacing S&P's 500 healthcare sector's growth. 
of 8.5%. So in that quarter, insurance went up for, for these six, top six insurers 29%, while healthcare growth went up 8.5%. So while some doctors do get paid a lot, they do provide care and they do take the risk, and they're hands-on, and they're, they're important. And I would say primary care physicians in Montana aren't making a lot of money. So again, $6 billion adjusted gross income, but this is the, the ticker in the whole thing. Some of the reasons cited for why the, these insurance companies are enjoying such great profits, as Jessica brought up, benefit of this lower medical cost trend from actually some provisions of Obamacare, like medical home. It's, it's just amazing where people are actually getting healthier, increasing high deductible plans, Medicaid and Medicare government plans. So more of the private insurance companies are getting into Medicaid, Medicare, and government plans like you know, employee health insurance plans. So those were my takeaways that actually um, there's a lot of reasons why the United States pays twice as much per capita and has still a high rate of uninsured, and one of them is because of insurance. Thanks. And thanks for sticking it out with us this whole day. This has been incredible for me. Um, so just to start off, what I've taken away from today is that the problems around cost are extremely complex, right? And there's not one solution. Um, and that the best decisions, we've, we saw great examples today happen when all the stakeholders are at the table. Um, we saw that with the clinical trials legislation. Um, we, and we saw it with the palliative care um, advisory council. Those didn't happen just because it was a great idea and people thought it would be nice. Um, a lot of work and effort went into that. Um, a lot of um, work in building relationships and trust relationships between whether it's the payers, the providers, the consumers, um, the advocates. And um, that's when it was just a real good reminder today that that's when our best decisions are made. Um, and then policy-wise, what I, what I heard loud and clear throughout the day is that there's three main areas where we can at least slow down the costs of cancer care. Um, and one is make sure fewer people get cancer, that we use evidence-based prevention policies to do that. Um, you know, it's great for us to tout prevention, but we really need to look at what are those policies that are evidence-based that we know reduce the death and disease or reduce um, the incidence rates of cancer? Um, second is um, when we improve the quality of life for cancer patients and other people with serious illness, we tend to also reduce the costs. When people feel better, um, they're less likely to go, to go into the hospital and um, need more care. And lastly, we, people have better outcomes um, and, can pre and have those conversations, those critical conversations with their providers, um, get their screening, and get the best quality treatment when they have access to care, when they have insurance coverage. So those are my takeaways. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. And, uh, and this reminded me that it was about seven or eight years ago, an insurance industry person, very knowledgeable person, he said to me that if you look at the entire spectrum of healthcare, the entire healthcare industry, that pharmaceuticals make up about 10% of the industry. He said, but if you look at the same spectrum of the health industry and look at profit, Regardless of how you want to define profit, the pharmaceutical industry is 50% of the entire whole. So I always thought that was interesting. So next, I'm going to combine two questions because of time considerations. I want to get us uh, done in time so that there will be some questions from the audience. 
and still be done by a quarter till. So no filibustering, okay? <laughs> okay, so what I want to combine is that we have a special session that starts on Monday with committee work. And, you know, I want, I want your take on that in context of what this conference is about, cancer patients, and then you can broaden out from there. But then I want you to also work into that heading into the 2019 legislative session. We have some big issues there that also affect cancer patients, and the most obvious one <coughs> is Medicaid expansion. So if we could do that, that would be great. Jess, you want to start us off? Thank you so much. So. Um, Next week, um, our legislators uh, will be coming back to town, and, and thank you for um, all of the hard work, Representative Balance and Senator Cafaro, that you've put into looking for common ground um, to um, help address uh, the situation. In the, you know, in the last legislative session, one of the things that the legislature uh, considered uh, quite a bit was the cost of health care overall. And you've heard the statistics about um, how much the, the cost of health care is driven by uh, tobacco, the, the 400 million uh, sum um, uh, we spend every year uh, as a state on tobacco costs, the 80 some million in Medicaid alone that, that we all pay for uh, here in Montana uh, for that cost. And, um, you know, if, if we're going to address uh, the cost of health care overall, uh, we, we have to look at at these kinds of things, you know, bundled payments and, and um, you know, CPC plus and, and all of that stuff is important. There is no, you know, one solution to healthcare costs, but um, these kind of critical uh, cost drivers um, can't be ignored and whether, whether that's something that um, we look at again in, in 2019 or, or uh, in, in a legislative um, special session, um, uh, is a question for the legislature, but the thing is we, we have to look at it. Um, it's so interesting, uh, Director Hogan and I and, and uh, Dr. Holzman were at an event uh, uh, earlier uh, this week about um, substance use treatment, and um, there was a lot of discussion about the 181 Montanans who die every year, uh, or sorry, who died from 2012 to 2015 um, from prescription o opioids, but um, when, you, when you look at tobacco-related causes of death, it's what, 1,600 people uh, uh, who die every year, and that wasn't even brought up. Uh, and so um, I think we, uh, we have to continue um, looking at a tobacco tax, um, uh, you know, leading up to, to 2019 or as near as we can in the future in Montana. That's just absolutely critical. Um, the other thing I think that um, will be critical to look at in Montana um, is, of course, uh, our Medicaid expansion. Um, Medicaid expansion has uh, uh, been a tremendous benefit, both in terms of our state's bottom line as well as um, in improving access to preventive care. In fact, in the first year alone, I learned um, half of the total population had already accessed preventive care uh, and screening. And that, and that is the kind of trend that we need to continue here in our state. Um, uh, obviously, it also has tremendous financial benefits for our bottom line. Medicaid expansion has already saved our state more than 30 million in, in general fund costs um, it, uh, for the Department of Health and Human Services. And I brought some statistics that are specifically um, relevant to the issue of cancer. Um, there's a program in Montana called the Medically Needy Program, which says if I have medical costs, that are so great um, uh, that I um, that it effectively lowers my income to Medicaid eligibility level, then um, Medicaid will help pay for some of, some of my health care. But you have to spend your income down on these high, high health care costs until you reach that stage. Well, um, I asked uh, Director Hogan and her team for some statistics, and it turns out that um, the Medicaid expansion has already saved uh, from that medical ne medically needy program more than $4 million in general fund uh, savings because now the federal government finances some of those costs that used to come just out of our pockets. 
Um, they also uh, gave me some great statistics from the breast and cervical cancer program, and um, you know, thanks. Which that, you know, that program um, gives Medicaid uh, dollars to help pay for the care of Montanans who were diagnosed with cancer or precancerous conditions of the breast or cervix. And um, thanks to Medicaid expansion, more than 679,000 in general funds um, uh, were saved uh, for that program um, because of the refinancing due to federal dollars. Uh, and so um, these are just a few of the benefits. It's, it's a tremendous uh, deal uh, for our state. Um, there, there are now 32 states that have expanded Medicaid with Maine uh, this week, uh, expanding Medicaid by ballot initiative. Uh, not a single state has repealed uh, Medicaid expansion, nor has Congress, because obviously um, it, is, it is a tremendous deal for our state and, the, and, the, and, and um, we're looking forward to continuing it. Thanks, Jessica. Um, a couple of things uh, on the special session. First of all, I think it, it's really important to understand that we're talking about a, a revenue shortage. We're not talking about uh, uh, issues with spending necessarily. This is a revenue shortage. We believe it's temporary. We think it's a point in time. We think it's driven a lot by the tax discussions that are happening in Washington, which unfortunately may amount to nothing, which, which means that we've gone through a lot of pain here in Montana for, for something that may not even happen. Um, regardless of that, the revenue estimate is, uh, is what it is. We have to react to it. That was a $230 million budget deficit that we have to react to. So a couple things have happened. First of all, um, the governor announced his cuts, which the max he can do is 10%. He did 10% across the board, uh, which I believe was the right thing to do at the time. I've, I've been in private industry my whole career, and uh, that is exactly what we did. We always went to the max first. Then it gave us time to sort through our priorities and determine where we really needed to make those cuts. But at least what you got back from every department or every agency with some reasonable cuts that they could make. And then you got into, okay, what, what are the things that we're really gonna do? So um, there are a number of things that have happened. One, a third of that cost is, is due to uh, fires that nobody foresaw and some decisions that we as a legislature made that if I had to go back and do them again, I would not have done, uh, where we used the fire fund to pay for some other things uh, in the general fund. We should not have done that. We should have done it a little bit differently. I'd also uh, remind you, if you, if most of you uh, may recall, that we also did three levels of cuts during the session itself. So we come in pretty lean to begin with. So to have this cut on top of it, yes, is very painful. So uh, we looked at this. Uh, in the news, you'll see that uh, Republicans and Democrats, they don't talk to each other. We're calling each other names. We're, uh, we're not working together. I can tell you uh, that is not the case. We've been working for months, ever since September, to try and find some ways to lessen the severity of the cuts particularly to the services to people receiving. And, and the issue there for me, many, there are a lot of promises that have been made to the people of Montana. Some of those promises I may not have agreed with, some of them I not have, may not have been here when they were made, but the fact is the promises were made. You don't use a special session, in my opinion, to rip the costs out, to make programs go away, that maybe I politically don't agree with. That's, that's just not the right way to do business as a state. The special sessions should be used to cut only the things that we can't find another way to finance. But I also strongly believe that when we have a temporary shortage of revenue, that is not the time to go out and raise permanent taxes. Um, I, personally, I believe that we shouldn't be raising taxes on people right now anyway. If you go across this state, you see people are still struggling to make ends meet. It's a difficult time for them too. And a lot of them are the very families that we talked about today on these panels. So that's not the right answer either. We, I think, got about as creative as we could get to find some middle ground where we could look at things where we had excess cash for the moment so the state could stop paying for a period of time. 
Uh, we had some other things that had been on the table for a while that we thought we could do, and we believed that we could take at least another third away from those cuts that the governor initially made so that that $230 million got closer to $75 million for the governor to make. Um, in the end, those are his to make. That is, uh, the agencies work for him. We don't control it. We leave town. And how those processes get implemented, how the agencies react, that's up to the governor. And those $75 million of cuts will be in his hands to do. He has put that on the table. They haven't actually been made yet. They will be implemented in the special session. Uh, but I think you know that is that is where we are, and that's I, I think a pretty good middle ground solution, and a lot of working together that is a lot of it behind the scenes, uh, won't get talked about a lot, but that's where we are. We have actually expanded the session, and that is uh, I think the first time a, a session called by a governor has ever been expanded. Uh, we needed 76 signatures on a petition. We got 81 as of this morning. Uh, the session is officially expanded to include some other things that we see as possibilities to lessen the impact of these cuts. And I, just real quickly, let me say some things we need to do. Medicaid expansion, yes, that's big, but I think there's some bigger things. There are Medicaid uh, innovation waivers that we are talking about that I know Director Hogan is talking about, and that the uh, auditor's office, the state auditor's office, the insurance commissioner is also talking about. So one of the things we've got to do is get together and talk about, you know, we, we need to bring those three entities together, which is maybe harder than bringing the Republicans and Democrats together sometimes. But we need to do that so that we're creating innovative solutions for the state of Montana. I think they can really move us forward. Two, thing, two things about the special session that impact. Two things about the special session that impact people who have cancer, people who are uh, survivors, family members. Uh, I'll start with one. In the expanded call, there is uh, just a minute here. Do you mind holding this for yeah. me? Just help me one sec here. Anything for you, Mary. Thank you. Anything? <laughs> okay, so so the call of the session, what that is, is it lays out what what issues will be addressed at the session. And with a special session, you're supposed to stay pretty strictly within those guidelines. Um, in the expanded call, number seven says, revise health care and insurance coverage laws by authorizing application for state innovation waivers and the development of programs to ensure affordable care and coverage for high-risk individuals. You know who that is high-risk individuals. So um, put that in your hat for just a minute. When I was in the restaurant waiting for the roads to get better, I was reading The Week, and in an article called Trump Targets Obamacare, they uh, quote a La Los Angeles Times article that says Obamacare works by offsetting the higher health care costs of older, sicker consumers with the premiums of younger, healthier people. So I'm just going to read that again. Obamacare works by offsetting the higher health care costs of older, sicker consumers with the premiums of younger, healthier people. So the idea is one pool, and you're sharing risk and resources. And what I just read to you is the opposite of that. It is a high-risk pool where people with high risk go and they have one insurance product that covers all the, the sickest people and there's no way to offset costs by having the healthier people in that pool. So when I was a grassroots organizer back during um, the Governor Martz and, and Roscoe years, Montana Comprehensive Health Association was a high-risk pool that, uh, insurance product we had in Montana. We, we had this already. And it was a product that you had to have been denied by three insurance companies first to even qualify. 
and then you had to have certain conditions and once you actually qualified what happened is you had to wait twelve months before your coverage would cover what you needed the health care for so when i was a grassroots organizer there was a bill to for premium subsidy to help low income people be able to access the high risk pool after being denied by the insurance company um, three times and this woman a super I mean, just an awesome mother of four children, had been through a severe health care crisis. She said it was the best day of my life and the worst day of my life. I found out I was pregnant, and I found out I had brain cancer. And she had no insurance. And so what she did was the doctor said, you need an abortion, and she said no. She's keeping her baby, and she kept her baby until she had a brain stroke, and she had to have a third of her brain removed. And so what that woman needed was access to health care, and you can bet in those days, I mean, I'd, I think it was in the early 2000s, nobody wanted to cover her. So she was our, one of our key uh, testifiers in front, of the, in front of the House Committee and the Senate Committee to try to get premium subsidy for the high-risk pool, MCHA. And the legislators were moved by her story, and it passed. And, and a lot of work by other people, including Claudia Clifford <laughs> at the time. However, when everything rolled out, she went to get insurance coverage and she could not afford it. Absolutely could not afford it. And so I just want to say, I don't know what developing a high risk pool has to do with the budget, but it's, it's, a, it's a road that we have to be careful that Montana's experience was not positive. The MCHA went away. I was asked by the MCHA board to sponsor the bill. Now, I know it's, it was good for some purposes, but with the Affordable Care Act and other strategies like Medicaid expansion, people who have high risk can be in the same pool as everybody else, and I think that's important. Second, um, the budget cuts. Oh, I have to stop. Sorry. So, Kristen, it's your conference, and we're out of time. <laughs> but um, why don't you go ahead and, and make a, a statement? I will. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so a lot has already been covered, and tobacco tax has been a reoccurring theme. And, you know, there's ideologies about whether this is the time for a permanent tax or not. But for the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network, we're not in the business of tax, we're in the business of saving lives. And we know the evidence is for every 10% that you raise the price of a pack of cigarettes, you see up to a 7% reduction in youth use. Well, guess what? This is a child onset disease, addiction to nicotine. 90% of all long-term users of tobacco products start before the age of 18. Between 12, 50% between the ages of 12 and 15. So we like to say it's a choice and that, um, you know, we're, we're picking on a certain um, population, but really who's picking on the population is the tobacco industry. This last session they spent $200,000, just two companies, to kill the tobacco tax bill. It passed through the Senate and it got walloped in the House. Because magically the revenue, um, the revenue estimate was accepted at like 90%, which was never, has not been done in my tenure as um, a lobbyist. So that's not gonna ever get passed unless there's political will. And that's what this is all about. It's about each and every one of us in this room having conversations with our lawmakers back home, running for office. It's about asking questions of candidates at forums. And it's holding folks accountable when we know there's evidence-based policies that can win and save lives and save money and increase the funding for things that are desperately needed. The end. Thank you very much. And, and unfortunately, we don't have time for questions, but 
you know, these people are here or you can email them or call them or however you choose to uh, interact with them. So um, what a great panel, isn't this something else? Thank you very much. And before we leave, <laughs> you're not here yet. Um, I would like to thank all of our presenters today. They were magnificent. I would like to say, thank St. Patrick's for a wonderful facility and a fantastic lunch. I want to say the survivor panel set the tone for today. Hearing their stories were very um, hard, but they were also uplifting. You guys rock. You are survivors. Thank you. But you know, they only scratched the surface because they, they and others could go on with that. The providers helped us explain the new drugs coming up and approve, but that the costs are astronomical. We heard about palliative care. Palliative care is so close to the heart of the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network. There is a bill in front of Congress. Uh, it's, its nickname is Pachita and um, it would do so much for helping with education. Um, we heard complimentary care works, but it's not being paid for. We heard that there was needs for appropriate pain medication for those for symptom management, but it's become very difficult because of people being concerned about the opioid crisis. Cancer care is complex. <laughs> It's complex. We heard that from every panel. And it's also very expensive. We heard who's going to pay. It was encouraging to hear from our compassionate physicians panel um, who claim they all have the best job. And that, was, that brought hope to my heart. How do providers cope? That was a fascinating question and one that I hadn't really thought about, but it was wonderful to hear. We heard about um, hope of seeing changes in medical school and also the importance of, yes, palliative care. We heard about you know, better insurance, few, you know, fewer underinsured. We heard that you know, patient incentives we heard about provider incentives. We heard about drugs. Yes, the eye drops again being wasted. Uh, we heard about futile treatment. And yes, that's something that we do have to discuss. Palliative care helps with that. We also heard that the insurance companies are concerned with all the complexity and that they do track complaints and they do track uh, systems so that they can help add to that and, and prevent things. We heard about regulation of pharmaceuticals. We heard about smokers losing one day of life for every week that they smoke. That, that was terrifying. You heard from our providers about the importance of action with our legislators, and Kristen mentioned this again. That's what the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network does. If you want to be part of our exciting work, and it is exciting. I've been doing this for over 20 years. And it is the best non-paying job I have ever had in my life. It's also, it would have been the best paying job I ever had in my life. But it is wonderful. When I've met people who have been impacted by legislation that I helped pass, it gives me chills. And it makes me work even harder. Please join us simply by becoming members. You can do that today. There's membership forums in all of your packets. You can go to acs.org um, and, and join that way. Yes, we accept credit cards. You don't just have to pay the $10. You could pay a little more. That actually helps us do even more work. If you would like to become part of the legislative ambassadors, you, you saw a number of them on the, on the panel. I'm a legislative ambassador. The work we do is so important. Um, and if you don't like to talk to legislators, but I'll tell you, they're great people to talk to, um, you can help us in other ways. There's so many different things that we can and do do. Um, 
We invite and ask everyone here to join us in changing the, the cost of cancer, the pain, the fear, the expense. By joining together, all of us, as Kristen was saying, we can do so much to prevent cancer, which does relieve the costs and also to relieve the pain. There was talk of tobacco tax, another one that I will tell you about that you will see in How Do We Measure booklet, tanning beds. If we could decrease that, we could save, and it's youth that usually do that. We could save lives. We could save a lot of pain. My husband, of course, growing up where we did, you didn't hear about sunscreen because you wanted to tan. Well, I can't tell you, he's lost part of his ear. He has stuff burned off of his arms. His arms are killing him right now. We can stop a lot of that pain and a lot of that problem. Please join us today. Go to ACS Can. Go and, and like us on Facebook, like us on Twitter, find out what we're doing. There's a lot you can do. Our advocacy can be as simple as pressing a button when you get an action alert from Chelsea. Thank you all so much for being here today. We appreciate it greatly. Let's keep this discussion going among ourselves, among friends and families, back where you work, and let's get back together again and continue this discussion. On behalf of the American Cancer Society, Cancer Action Network, thank you. And have a great day.